to hear this morning. Uh, last week, uh, we, and by the way, I did want to just uh, highlight, I have a little note here, uh, my disclaimer, that as we talk about race relationships, particularly in the United States today, and how as Christians we kind of engage and deal with these issues, uh, that uh, what I am going to share this morning is not born out of uh, our uh, you know, church's official stances or are reflective of uh, the beliefs of our denomination. These are just my thoughts as a pastor, and their purpose is to encourage us to, again, think and then uh, spend time uh, together in prayer. So that being said, uh, last week we looked at how, how we respond to this, the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, and I noted two important ideas, two red flags that I think are worth noting in our, uh, as we deal with issues, and all of this set against the backdrop of, uh, you know, the cultural uh, differences between a biblical worldview versus a secular humanist worldview, and that is the topic of censorship and, and then uh, the emerging of new ethics, new kind of right and wrong. And in the context of COVID, we talked about how uh, with the state uh, kind of determining the response and the conventional wisdom as they use science to determine what's the best and what's the worst things to do for society in terms of dealing with a pandemic, that censorship is kind of a danger, that those who oppose those ideas can oftentimes be cast out or silenced. It's not, I said it's kind of a orange flag, it's not the biggest concern. Uh, my bigger concern is then also with that comes new ethics, this idea that you know, it's your responsibility if your grandma catches COVID-19, you gave it to them. And that's a heavy burden that we haven't really placed on people in terms of communicable diseases. And so those kind of things are kind of red flags, things that we should think about and look at, particularly as we uh, think through what our worldview is and how that shapes how we deal with both uh, the way we speak and our ethics. So today we're going to talk about white supremacy. I I looked it up online, I googled it, I've been hearing the word white supremacy, white nationalism quite a bit in society, and, and so I, I googled it and I just found a picture of myself, uh, just joking, I shaved my head for uh, this particular uh, joke. No, uh, it's a little bit awkward t- talking about white supremacy. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that it's a fairly serious topic, and, uh, and I'll try my best to uh, to be serious when, when appropriate. Uh, the fact of the matter is that we are living in a time where race relations seem to be uh, quite difficult in our society, and there's much that's being talked about. And as Christians, how do we then engage in that in a fruitful and healthy and way that is representative of, um, of Christ? And just look in here, JR and Don, nice to have you guys checking in. My sister's joining us from Germany. Hey, sis, nice to see you or at least know that you're listening. All right, let's talk about white supremacy and racism. I want to begin by just acknowledging a few things. Heidi and I, when we first were married, uh, many of you know we moved to Hungary as missionaries. Part of that transition, we had little kids, was that we had to take a class and learn about something called ethnocentricity, that when you are raised in a particular culture and you immerse yourself in another culture, they can be a challenge because there's a lot of things that you take for granted you think are just normal but are not normal in other places. And ethnocentricity is this tendency that all people have to see the way they do things, the way they speak, the way they dance, the way the food they eat, all the things about their life as being kind of the center or the best way. And when you encounter a culture that is different than you, there's this tendency to do one of two things. Uh, one, of rejecting your own culture, or two, uh, rejecting the culture that you're in. We have a hard time not comparing and saying one is better than the other, because a lot of times things, sometimes things are better than the other, right? But, but there is this tendency that we have to always think the way we've been raised, or our particular culture, ethnicity, is the center. That's the best. And so, uh, you know, as missionaries, you're taught to, to be very weary of that concept. Uh, when I was uh, in Hungary, one of the things I noticed is that most people, and actually I've traveled to a lot of different cultures and different countries, most people are ethnocentric. Uh, it's very rare that you'll go to a, a different country and they'll be like, you know, our food is garbage, but there's McDonald's down the road. We know Americans do it best, right? 
that's that, that's not usually the case. Usually they're very proud of what they give you. When we were in Hungary, they had this stuff called halasle, and uh, it was fish soup. It was disgusting, and uh, I didn't like it. But you know, it wasn't more disgusting than American soup. It was just disgusting as in a fish soup would be disgusting no matter where, but they loved it. And, uh, and, and, and Heidi did too. She was much more uh, you know, culturally accepting than I was. Um, and, and, and so there is this sense in which when, when we deal with culture and differences, we don't always know what to do. And we don't always know how to act. And it's sometimes easier to kind of retreat to what we are familiar with and know and to be centered upon that. And you mix into that human tendency because one of the things with ethnocentricity is that it's not necessarily always bad. It's some, some of it is just normal. It's normal to have pride in things that are good, things about your culture that are good. Uh, all humans have a, a certain level of decency and goodness about them. And one of the things that my experience has been is going around the world is most people are, are, are just pretty easy to get along. There's a basic human nature that is in everyone. Um, this is most, for me, this is uh, uh, most obvious when I play sports. When I think that there's a big difference in skin color and the way, you know, our, our genes have made us and the way that our cultures or ethnicities have kind of developed us, all of those things are very obvious until you get on a, a you know, a, a football pitch or a soccer field, as we say in America. You get on a, out in a, in, a, in a field and all of a sudden, all of the language changes. It's like, it's one of my favorite things to do is play sports. I've played uh, things, like, you know, whether it's cricket with some uh, Indian college kids or ping pong with some guys who are Myanmar students in the Philippines, or I've played baseball in Hungary, which is a hilarious experience. Uh, but in every situation I've ever played sports, there's always been this universal kind of human nature that all of the other things that, that seem to distinguish us kind of fall away and all the things that are universal kind of come out. Competitive nature, you know, being a good teammate, being fast, doing, doing something good, acknowledging uh, good plays and being embarrassed about bad plays and all of that is exactly the same. And so there's this idea that we have, at least in a biblical worldview, that human nature, no matter what on the external is, Internally, it's the same. People are people. And that dignity uh, comes from God, that he endows each of us with the basic human nature, which is in his image. And so that's our, our kind of our baseline. And that seems pretty obvious. I hope that I don't want to belabor that. I hope that that's something that's common. That's what I was raised to kind of believe, that essentially our skin color, so the fact the idea of white is not that important, it doesn't really matter what, the, what your skin color is or the shape of your face or your genes. Now, when we get into this idea of white supremacy, that becomes something that is very elevated. We can look back to uh, this idea of ethnicity genetics as being particularly important uh, in the last, really, 150 years, um, going on really now 200 years since... Uh, kind of the advent of materialism, Darwinism, we'll talk about that in, in the future, but not this morning. I would uh, encourage you to read or at least consider uh, G.K. Chesterton's has a book called Eugenics and Other Evils. It's very difficult to read, so I'll just put that out there, but I've been reading it, and it's, it's helpful and just a good resource. You can find it on our, on our website. The hope, though, in, I think, for all of us, I hope that in this kind of center space, no matter where, if we're a secular humanist or whether we're you know, coming from a biblical worldview, in the middle is this idea that we want there to be reconciliation. We want people uh, to get along. And how that happens is really where the argument is. And in the middle of that is this idea of equality, that we want people to be treated equally. And, and how we do that with within multiple races, ethnicities, different ways people do things gets very difficult. But I would encourage us that when our focus is on digni and people's dignity and that people are, in fact, created with God's image, that actual multiculturalism is a really healthy thing, that it can produce inspiration. For example, uh, we can actually find out that there are better foods in the world than what we were raised on, 
the ones with things that I like to call flavor um, versus, you know, that when I was raised by, you know, Norwegian grandparents who kind of passed on their flavorless food to the next generation and the next generation. And then all of a sudden, multicultural came in and said, oh, here's something called flavor and we are able to grow. So it can be inspirational, and there's also the negative side of it, that we are, well, every culture has foibles and problems, and those actually produce opportunity for humor, that actually making fun uh, can uh, be a way to bring about universal, kind of this idea that does not take ourselves too seriously. So I want to just talk about new ethic for a minute. So there is something that, uh, and I call it kind of the, the glitch in the Matrix, if you know the, the movie The Matrix. There's these points where something happens in our, in our culture that I go, well, wait, that doesn't make sense. Hold on. What happened? Uh, it, what's going on? And I read this article uh, a little while ago. It's... Uh, it's, it was published in the music section of USA Today by a guy named Patrick Ryan. This is back in 2018. And he wrote 20 politically incorrect songs that would be wildly controversial today. And so, um, you go to the next slide, Matt. The, um, this article was interesting to me because it listed 20 different songs that when they were written... Uh, they were fine, but nowadays they would not be okay. Actually, uh, to be honest with you, if the guy was honest, many of these songs were controversial in the, when they were published. And the same co controversy could be today. It just maybe new people find it offensive that didn't used to find it offensive. But they were offensive back then, and they are offensive today. But in the midst of this article, uh, he highlights one song, and he lists the song, Ebony and Ivory by Paul McCartney and Stevie Wonder. It was published in 1982. I've heard of the song. Maybe you've heard of it as well. And he gives the choice lyric, the lyric that, is, that he says is problematic. And, and I'll read that to you. He says, Ebony and Ivory live together in perfect harmony, side by side on my piano keyboard. Oh, Lord, why don't we? And I go, okay, I'm not sure why that's controversial. That's literally how I was raised, was to be taught that it doesn't matter what your skin color is. We're all people. We're different, but we're all the same. We can work together and, and find reconciliation, and, uh, and good things can come of that. And then he answers the question, why wouldn't it fly today? And here's what he says, McCartney and Wonder meant well by their hyper-literal interpretation of race relationships. But their message of, and he quotes the song, people are the same, there's good and bad in everyone, so let's just get along, end of quote, would be interpreted as hilariously naive by the more woke faction of today's cultural discourse. And here's the kind of glitch in the matrix that, that I say, is that there is an ethic that says at the core foundation of human beings is this image of God, this humanity, and that the external things, the color of our skin, the culture that we were raised, are ancillary to this supreme idea of the human being. What's happening in our culture today is to say that that actually, no, 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 that's, that's wrong. That's a naive or a misunderstanding, that actually our skin color has a great deal to do. Our ethnicity has a great deal to do with both our identity and our sense of who we are as people. And that we live in a world in which we have these different groups of people, and there have been some who have been more powerful than others and have created a disequilibrium or an inequality in the world. And we would identify a couple primary uh, issues. For example, colonialism, so that Northern Europeans participated in colonialism, going out and colonizing different lands as the world grew. Along with uh, colonialism, it led way to uh, what is often referred to as the Industrial Revolution, which has created a massive amounts of wealth in, in the world, centralized primarily in those colonial countries that industrialized. And this has led to great inequality. And so, in a biblical worldview, we go, how do we deal with this? We can't neglect that. We can't just say that doesn't exist. We know that exists. And we know that there are, there are those in the world that live in greater poverty and those that live in greater wealth. 
and that sometimes, and quite, quite often, those cut across ethnic and racial lines. And so how is it that we then both acknowledge that and then deal with that? And I would say that it's in, it's in this idea of equality. It's in this uh, kind of debatable place. We all kind of say, well, we want there to be a sense of equity. We try to teach our children, you treat people with dignity no matter what their skin color, no matter who they are. Um, the problem is, what does equality mean? And, and that's where we get into some difficulties. In a, within a biblical worldview, where do we place equality? And, and I think the answer is we would say that God loves each of us the same. We would place it at that local space of saying their human nature, that dignity. But that would be like me giving both my kids a card where I wrote, dear so-and-so, and saying, I love you, you're wonderful, you're great, you're the best. But then I put in you know, one of their cards a couple thousand dollars and the other card two dollars, and I handed it to them. And they said, well, that's great. I'm glad, Dad, that you have great dignity, right? But why does he have 2000 I guess Calvin has the $2,000 in this situation, and Miro didn't get it. I'd be like, well, you know, culturally, the older son receives the inheritance. That's just part of the inequality. Welcome to, you know, the world we live in today. And she would say, well, then there's no dignity. You can't say dignity and at the same time not have material wealth. And then you take out the God part of that. Now I just hand my kids a, a wad of cash each. And that's the society that we live in today, is to say that we have lost this idea of God bringing dignity and that there is this eternal kind of righting of all wrongs and inequalities in the world. And so that the wealth of the poor is in the gospel message. And they would say, well, if there's no gospel message, then the only way to make things right is in the material realm. And so dignity and wealth no longer are separated. You and I, as, as a biblical review, we would separate those two ideas out. Just because someone has wealth does not make them, give them dignity. What gives them dignity is God. And they would replace the word dignity with wealth and power. Because that's the only way you measure dignity in a secular humanist world. And I think that's why this issue of race is becoming more and more uh, divisive and a bigger issue. And we see this kind of work its way out in a little different ways. I'll just close with this example, and, uh, and we'll touch on the idea of censorship. So to speak out against this, to speak out against that kind of dynamic of equality versus, and dignity versus uh, equality in terms of wealth and power, is to speak out against what is common understanding. This last year, uh, Drew Brees was interviewed, and I don't know if you know the quarterback, Drew Brees, it was kind of this big controversy. Maybe you missed it if you listened to sports radio like I did. It was impossible to miss. Um, but he uh, basically came out when after the, the protests that followed George Floyd's uh, the, you know, tragic death. Uh, Drew Brees uh, basically came out, and, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, said, you know, I don't want to basically, you know, dishonor the flag and kind of bring up this whole past thing with Colin Kaepernick in the past where there was kneeling during the national anthem in this protest. And he basically said, you know, for me, this is, this is you know, the, the, the flag and the national anthem. These are important parts of my culture, important parts of kind of uh, my family's history in the military. And so uh, it's not that I don't ha have anything against Black Lives Matter. It's just that this is important to me. It's a great example of when we're talking about ethnocentricity and just saying there are good things about our culture. And it resonated with a lot of people that were like, yeah, let's deal with that over here, but we don't have to throw out the good things about our history you know, and our nation. And what happened in that situation was he was immediately chastised, both by teammates and by the media, until he finally had to come out and give an apology, and then a second, and I think maybe a third. I don't know. He kept having to apologize 
for being insensitive. And on the back of his helmet, I noticed one time we were watching, I was watching football in the Saints, and it says, uh, it, I think I can't remember what it says, it takes all of us. So he has to have this thing on the back of his helmet that a uh, political statement says it takes all of us. And it's an acknowledgement to this, and we'll get, and this is just kind of a tease for next week. But what Drew Brees failed to understand was that even though there was nobody, any teammates or people in society that would have called Drew Brees a racist, he, you know, they, he's a really nice guy, and all his teammates really liked him. He's very respectful. Okay, so he's not a racist, and he, he, it's not that he wants to promote racism, but he's not enough anti-racist, and this is a word that's becoming more and more um, common in our language. You'll hear it. Are you? It's not enough that you're not racist. You have to be anti-racist, and what anti-racist means is you have to understand that this is not about an individual's actions against another individual based on their ethnicity or race. This is based on systems that have long kept some people oppressed while other people have flourished economically, um, socially. And so by not taking serious the movement to kind of protest what we'll, be, what we'll look at as institutional racism in the United States, Drew Brees is lending his voice to what we would call white supremacy, or oftentimes called white nationalism, this idea that the status quo is by nature or inherently racist or drawn up on racial lines. And you have someone like Drew Brees who wants to speak in and say, I don't want it to be about race. I want to give everybody human dignity. And part of our culture is that the American flag represents everybody. And so we need to move forward in a different direction. And we see him clearly being silent. And I say this because, uh, you know, even this morning, I feel pretty comfortable with those people who are here together, us gathered. But being online, we realize that it's not so much your intentions, right? If you aren't hateful towards another person based on their skin color, their race, that's not significant, or it's not enough. You have to support a particular system in order to overcome racism, and if you don't do that, then you can be labeled racist. And, and it's interesting because none of us want to be labeled racist. I think that's actually a good thing that white supremacy is such a negative connotation and that, it's being, that it can be used to guilt people and to spur the conversation to say we need to take serious the issue of race. The problem comes in how we deal with the problem of racism. And if we deal with it without God, we're in big trouble because we're actually promoting the very pride that is the problem that creates white supremacy in the first place, without acknowledging the fact that even though the world is not equal, we as human beings are equal in the eyes of God. And that's not just a platitude. It's actually something that is foundational to a biblical worldview and uh, and to what the Bible teaches. And so we have to be cautious about that. So that's enough uh, as far as that goes today. We'll actually deal more with this idea of institutions. Can institutions be racist? Um, When we'll deal with that next week. Before we kind of jump into that, I think it's worth our time to just consider um, the question. If you want to go to the next slide, Matt, we'll, we'll look at two questions for discussion because I think the most important thing from from a Christian's perspective, is to recognize that racism is something um, that only requires pride, and pride is something that is born in each and every one of us. Uh, that ethnocentricity, that nationalism can easily lead us to a pride in the wrong things. Not a thankfulness towards God, but a, but a, a sense of superiority in our own life towards other people. And so I'd like us to discuss two things. When have you seen real examples of racism? We need to not deal in, in the kind of general, like, oh, with these general, but, you know, real racism is a problem. When have you seen that and real prejudice in your life? And then what are the best ways to bring about reconciliation? So let's just go around. I know we have a, a small group here. 